All right. On behalf of the Department of Medicine, I want to thank you all for tuning in to today's Grand Rounds presentation on the role of neutrophils in inflammation and autoimmunity. Uh, it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Christian Lude as our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Lude completed his master's in biomedicine and his PhD in rheumatology at Lund University in Sweden before joining us here in Seattle. Since coming to the University of Washington, his lab has produced research that is forwarding our understanding of the role neutrophils play in the pathogenesis of autoimmunity through apoptosis and the extrusion of neutrophil extracellular traps. Uh, his work has shown great promise in the identification of novel biomarkers of disease activity and severity, as well as potential therapeutic targets and disease syndromes like systemic lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. Additionally, we've leveraged his expertise in neutrophil biology to study the role neutrophils play in the dysregulated immune response implicated in the development of acute lung injury, including disease states like ARDS and even COVID-19. Dr. Lude, we're very grateful to have you here with us today. Uh, please feel free at this time to share your screen and, and go ahead and start the presentation. To the audience on Zoom, I'll be monitoring the chat for questions and we'll try to consolidate them at the end of the talk, uh, but please feel free to type any as they come up and uh, we'll be watching that as we go along. Great, thank you, Johnny, for the kind introduction and I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, so as Johnny said, today we'll discuss neutrophils and some neutrophil biology and more so how neutrophils could contribute to inflammation and autoimmunity. These are just my disclosures. So I thought I wanted to start by sharing you an overview of what we will be discussing today. And first and foremost, I hope to share with you an appreciation for this, this cell, the neutrophil, and more so not only in host defense, but also the important role a neutrophil have, has in inflammation and how it could contribute to autoimmunity. And I would like to do so by highlighting three key effector functions of the neutrophils that are fairly novel. And so I'm also going to try to, throughout this presentation, link these novel effector functions to a clinical setting to give it some translational or clinical relevance. And when we discuss the mechanistic studies, I will do so from the perspective of lupus and using lupus as a model disease of auto autoimmunity as well as of inflammation. And as you may know, lupus is this autoimmune rheumatic disease where we have a lot of antibodies targeting nucleic acid containing components or proteins, and they form a lot of circulating immune complexes. And these immune complexes can activate neutrophils, and that activation occurs through binding to FC gamma receptor 2A, as implicated here on this slide. Once the immune complexes bind to FC gamma receptor 2A, they can be internalized. And this is a key, key effector function of the neutrophil, we call that phagocytosis. And these immune complexes will now be localized in an endosome inside the cell, where there's a lot of immune sensors, including toll-like receptors. And this will activate a cascade of signaling pathways within the neutrophil, most often leading to the generation of reactive oxygen species through the NADPH oxidase. The mitochondria are also important contributors of reactive oxygen species in the cell. And what we'll learn today is that once all of these uh, signaling cascades are ongoing, and in particular, when we have reactive oxygen species present, the neutrophil may decide to undergo this novel suicidal cell death process in which they swell and explode, throwing out their nuclear content in this web-like structure that we call a net or a neutrophil extracellular trap. And we will be discussing the implication of this process in host defense, but also all of the detrimental effects these, this release of nets could have in many pathologies. And this will be the first key point um, to discuss today, that nets can be released from these dying neutrophils. Another important aspect of neutrophil biology is that during all of these oxidative species that are present in the cell, the mitochondria itself may be poisoned, oxidatively damaged, and this could result in the release or extrusion of these mitochondria, releasing highly oxidized mitochondrial DNA inducing inflammation through the DNA sensing CGAS stink path. 
We will also discuss the implication of autoimmunity towards these components. We will discuss anti-net antibodies, but more so we will discuss antibodies targeting mitochondria and their implications in, in lupus as well as in other conditions. And then finally, as I mentioned in the beginning, we'll try to link these observations and I hope to convince you that measuring these components, including the anti-mitochondrial antibodies, but also markers of circulating net, may be helpful in many pathologies to help monitor patients, to help with diagnosis, but also to help to understand which patients are at risk of developing very severe disease. So since most of this presentation will be on neutrophils, I thought I should take a few steps back and introduce you to the actual cell we're talking about. So neutrophils are part of our innate immune system, and they're very common, very frequent in the bloodstream, composing about 60% or so of the white blood cells. And they are incredible immune cells in that they can sense their environment. They have lots of different immune receptors on the cell surface, including receptors to recognize complement components, cytokines, chemokines, we discuss the antibody receptors, the acetone receptors, and lots of toll-like receptors as well. So they can sense a pathogen or a danger-associated molecular pattern easily. And once they do so, they will start releasing many of their intracellularly stored granules or vesicles that contain these antimicrobial proteins and peptides, as well as immune receptors. And one key component that the neutrophil has that is not noted on this slide is a protein called BAF, B cell activating factor. And this is an incredibly important uh, protein that could activate or rather support B cell proliferation and survival. And of course, these cells are important in autoimmune conditions. And this protein BAF released from neutrophils is targeted in lupus by a drug called the Lumina. So we do implicate uh, neutrophil-derived molecules in, in our treatment strategies already today. Other than degranulation, we also mentioned the two other key functions of a neutrophils earlier in this presentation, namely phagocytosis as well as ROS production. So those are the three main functions of a neutrophils that we knew up until recently at least. And once a neutrophil has used these mechanisms to combat the pathogen, Usually, they will succumb to cell death in the program form of cell death called apoptosis. And this is a form of cell death where the cell will shrink and the nuclei will also shrink. And the cell will, on the cell surface, expose heat missing signals. And this will facilitate the clearance of those dying cells by a macrophage. And this will be done in a completely silent, non inflammatory manner to lead to resolution of inflammation. However, since the description of these functions or mechanisms, we have come to learn more about neutrophils. And not always do they succumb to apoptosis. But more recent data or studies suggest that sometimes the neutrophil doesn't shrink, but instead they swell and they explode and throw out this web-like structure that we call a net that could have detrimental effects on our health. And here we can see a, a, a enlarged picture of a net from a human neutrophil. And this is again the abbrevi abbreviation of neutrophil extracellular trap. And we can see beautiful web-like structure of a lot of DNA strands. And you can also see a lot of granular components. Here we have stained for neutrophil elastase, one of the neutrophil granular proteins. And this concept of net formation was described back in 2004 by the group of Brinkman and Suslinski, where they described that a neutrophil could throw out those web-like structures or nets in an attempt to trap and snare pathogens or different microbes, and very successfully keeping them in place and eventually killing the pathogens. So this is an important mechanism in host defense. We need it to combat pathogens. However, as with all immune systems, we need to keep it well regulated. If we can regulate net formation, if we have too much nets being formed, or if we lack the capacity to clear them efficiently, 
they may lead to harm. And since the observation of net formation, we and others have demonstrated that nets could very well be pathogenic. We and others have demonstrated that these nets, when being released and not cleared, could induce inflammation through DNA sensor. It has also been demonstrated that these nets can activate your endothelium, cause endothelial death and atherosclerosis, as well as trap platelets, cause platelet activation and subsequent thrombus formation. These nets can also propagate or promote tumor growth and proliferation, as well as help with metastasis. And finally, relevant for today's presentation, nets have been linked to autoimmunity and particularly to several rheumatic diseases. And the link to autoimmunity could be well illustrated in this cartoon where you can see the main constituents of the net. Among others, you may recognize myeloperoxidase, which is a key autoantigen in anti vasculitis. And we and others have done some good work in trying to understand the role of neutrophils and not least nets in the ankyovasculitis pathogenesis. We can also see neutrophil elastase, which is a key antigen in a syndrome called cocaine and labamazole associated autoimmunity syndrome. And we have done some work on this very fascinating disease that I wanted to share with you to try to highlight how we think that nets could contribute to this condition. For those of you who may not be familiar with this syndrome, it is a syndrome where patients who, who use cocaine that is usually ad adulterated with labamisole may develop these, these uh, clinical symptoms of, for an instance, uh, uh, purpura or ulcers on their, on their legs or anywhere on the, on the body. But they also could have renal involvement as well as arthralgias. But most importantly for this syndrome is that they develop autoimmunity. Many of them develop cardiolipin antibodies or phospholipid antibodies. And they could also be ANA positive and have rheumatoid factor. But more so frequently is, of course, the presence of antibodies targeting the neutrophil. Many of these patients, similar to ANCA vasculitis patients, have antibodies targeting myeloperoxidase as well as proteinase 3. However, in contrast to ANCA vasculitis, and what could be useful as a diagnostic marker of, these, of this syndrome is the double positivity of both antibodies targeting myeloperoxidase as well as proteinase 3, which is not seen in antivasculitis. Finally, we can also recognize that many of those patients with cocaine and labamazole associated autoimmunity syndrome, they lack antibodies targeting myeloperoxidase or proteinase 3. And what is unique with these patients is that many of them instead have antibodies targeting neutrophil elastase. And this is again not seen frequently in ankyo vasculitis and could also be helpful in diagnosis or identifying these patients who are addicted to cocaine. So since we now observe that patients with this syndrome had a lot of antibodies targeting neutrophil granular components, we asked whether these antibodies would also bind to, to the release or exploding neutrophil. To investigate that, we performed some microscopy. And here we're looking at the beautifully lobulated nuclei of a neutrophil. We have stained the DNA green. And here to, the, to our right, we are staining for IgG binding using serum from a cocaine user. And we can see the beautiful staining in the cytosol of these antibodies, similarly to what you would see in an ankylosculitis patient. If we then look at the DNA for these nets that are being thrown out from the activated neutrophil, you can see in the healthy control, of course, we don't see any staining. We don't have any autoimmunity. Whereas in this cocaine user, we see a robust binding of these autoantibodies, recognizing epitopes that are exposed on these nets. So the question now becomes, why is it that these cocaine users have antibodies that target these DNA strands or these granular components that should be retained within the cell, but now they're being exposed? Could it be that cocaine or maybe even the bamazole, the cutting agent, could poison the neutrophil and maybe have it undergo this process of cell death exploding throughout these antigens and expose them to our immune system? 
to investigate that, we did a similar experiment where we now look at net formation by these neutrophils. And in blue here, we have the lobulated nuclei, and in red, we have neutrophil elastics. In this experiment, we have activated the neutrophils with PMA, which is an inducer of net formation. And we see the lobulated nuclei, and we see some of the DNA strands being thrown out from the cell. So what will now happen when we add cocaine or levamisole to those neutrophils? And what I hope you can appreciate in these figures are that while not as efficient as our positive control, both cocaine and certainly the bamisole has the capacity to kill the neutrophils and have them explode throughout these net structures. And that may be a mechanism of how cocaine and the bamisole causes these, the inflammatory uh, condition as well as exposing key autoantigens for our immune system. So what are then the mechanisms of how cocaine and the bamisole could poison the neutrophil and have it undergo cell death? Well, there are two main pathways that are usually thought to be uh, involved in net formation. And one of those pathways relates to a process that we call citrullination. And citrullination acts to change an arginine into citrulline. When this occurs on a histone, it will facilitate decondensation of the chromatin. This is a key process in net formation. So we decided to block this process of citrullination, blocking PAD4, which is the enzyme facilitating citrullination. And we found that when we block citrullination, we no longer see any DNA release, or much less at least DNA release by both cocaine and levamisole. Similarly, when blocking ROS generation, which is also a key process in most forms of net formation, we similarly see very low induction of DNA release by cocaine and levamisole. So we could, could conclude that they relay, uh, relay on both the rust generation and the citrullination to induce DNA release. But of note, these components, cocaine and levamisole, not only release DNA, but they also release this very potent trigger of B cell survival and proliferation, namely BAF. So we propose that in, in an environment and in a condition where a patient is genetically susceptible to autoimmunity, that the release of immune components and release of autoantigens such as neutral elastase together with that may be sufficient to drive uh, loss of self tolerance in these patients. What I also mentioned was now that neutrophils, when they're activated, could release these proteins or enzymes called PAD2 and PAD4 with the capacity to citrullinate histones as well as other molecules. And these markers or these molecules now are citrullinated. And citrullinated peptides are, of course, targeted in rheumatoid arthritis. So now we have a beautiful web of citrullinated peptides that are seen in these patients. So what about neutrophils and nets in RA? Well, we do know that neutrophils are, of course, very important in the joints of rheumatoid arthritis, where they can infiltrate the synovial fluid, become activated by circulating immune complexes as well as, as inflammatory mediators. And the activated neutrophil will now start releasing proteases. It will release reactive oxygen species and facilitate this degradation and erosion of the cartilage, promoting disease. But this is all occurring in the synovium or in the joint. Could we also find evidence of a more systemic activation of the neutrophil that could contribute to systemic disease? To investigate that, we analyzed the levels of S100A8A9 in the circulation of patients with rheumatoid arthritis as well as health controls. And most of you may be more familiar with S100A8A9 by another name, namely calprotectin. So this is an inflammatory marker released by activated neutrophils. And it is commonly measured in feces from patients with IBD or Crohn's disease. But you can also measure it in circulation as a marker of, of neutrophil activation. And we can see that patients with rheumatoid arthritis have much higher levels of calprotectin as compared to health control, 
And more importantly, the levels of calprotectin correlates beautifully with the disease activity in these patients. So we have now validated and demonstrated that RA patients have activated neutrophils in the circulation. Um, but what about nets, net formation, these exploding neutrophils? And first I wanted to highlight a seminal paper by the group of Mariana Kaplan back, back in 2013, where she demonstrated that in the joints of RA patients, we have antibodies and we have inflammatory cytokines and they may act to prime the neutrophil to undergo this suicidal process of net formation. And these released nets may now act to propagate this vicious circle by activating fibroblast-like synoviocytes to induce more inflammation, as well as expose these border antigens to promote B-cell activation and antibody production. And this seems to be a very important process occurring at least in the joints. But could we then also find evidence that this may occur more systemically? So we set up an assay in my lab to start measuring levels of circulating nets in RA patients. And we do find, similarly to calprotectin, that levels of nets are elevated in RA patients as compared to healthy controls. And of interest, levels of nets are elevated also in patients with remission. And I think this is an important point and that even when patients have clinical remission, they may still have ongoing immunological disease activity or some kind of subclinical disease activity. And it may be harmful to let these patients go of their current treatment as they may then flare up. And that we currently, we need to consider also other treatment opportunities to fully block or suppress immune system activation in these patients as I would imagine that low-grade immune activation may contribute to this low-grade chronic inflammation that we know is detrimental to our patients in, in development of, of, of organ damage. So this is all good. We can now find patients that are, have a certain disease and it's associated with disease activity. But what is more relevant is not to find markers that can uh, tell something that the clinician can already tell you, you have active joint disease activity. What is more relevant is whether we can find a marker that can tell you something about the future. Can these markers of neutral activation and neutral cell death inform the patient that you will develop a very severe erosive disease? To investigate that, we collaborated with Lee Nelson at Fred Hodge. And she had developed this cohort, an inception cohort of more than 250 RA patients that were followed for a median of eight years. So the question we asked was, can we now measure at baseline, at the first visit when they come to the rheumatologist, can we there find evidence of neutrophil activation? And if so, does that tell us anything about the disease progression over the next couple of years? We do know already that certain markers, such as seropositivity or presence of ACPA antibodies in RA patients, have the capacity to predict disease progression. And we could validate that those findings and see that if you have ACPA positivity, um, when you see your doctor, you have an odds ratio of six to develop erosive disease within the next couple of years. But similarly, if you, when you see your doctor at the first time you see your rheumatologist, have calprotectin or have elevated neutral activation, you're similarly prone to develop a, an erosive severe disease. And importantly, these observations were independent of each other in that we could combine them and see an additive effect with an even higher odds ratio of identifying patients that were going to develop erosive disease. Suggesting that there is an added advantage of using this in a clinical setting, also measuring calprotectin. We also investigated development of joint space narrowing, and we found again that calprotectin could identify these patients that were to develop joint space narrowing, something that was not seen for ACPA or seropositivity. And finally, RA is not only contained to the joint, but we also see extra articular manifestations, including interstitial lung disease, but, but also development of extra articular nodules. 
And over here, again, we start to see that if the patients at baseline have a presence of a neutrophil activation marker, they can, it can be predictive of a very severe disease progression, including development of extraarticular nodules that cannot be informed um, by the uh, act of positivity. So at least in RA, we believe that these markers, and in particular calprotectin, but also NET, may be helpful tools for the clinician to identify patients that are having a very severe disease progression, allowing for more close monitoring, and maybe even more so aggressive treatment to avoid these, these disabling disease manifestations. And the final disease I wanted to touch upon before we go into the more mechanistic insights is of course lupus. And these patients with lupus or systemic lupus erythematosus have a lot of antibodies targeting the nets. They recognize the chromatin, so the histones and the DNA, so the, the bulk of what is released by these neutrophils. So could it be that nets are also present and maybe even contributing to lupus pathology? So the first question we asked here was whether lupus patients have evidence of circulating nets in, in the blood. And we analyzed them using this surrogate marker that we have set up in our lab, named their complex between myeloproxidase and DNA. And we find that these levels are elevated also in lupus patients as compared to the healthy control. And the levels in SLE patients are associated with active disease, but it's also related to disease severity and more so elevated in patients that have this severe form of lupus nephritis, the kidney inflammation. So since we now found this association with a severe active disease, we asked whether levels of NETS not only could identify patients with active disease, but whether they could also identify patients that were going to develop active disease if we had a predictive value of this marker. So to investigate that, we, we reached out to some of our collaborators over in Sweden, and they have this beautiful longitudinal cohort of lupus patients of 47 patients that are followed every three months for a couple of years. So we decided to identify 47 patients that had been in remission for at least six months, and they were currently also in complete remission and we then decided that about a third of them will remain in remission, and then two thirds of them or so will have a flare within the next couple of months. The question being, can we at baseline identify who is going to remain in remission or who is going to flare? So we analyzed levels of nets also in these patients. And we found here at baseline that if they had very low levels of nets, so no evidence of neutral activation or neutral death, the majority of them would remain in remission with, for, the, for the next couple of months. However, if they already here at baseline showed evidence of neutral cell death, so they had elevated levels of net, the majority of them were now at risk of flaring within the next couple of months. Similarly, to highlight this, we identified here again at baseline if the patients had no evidence of net formation, they were going to have very low disease activity over the next year. Whereas if they had evidence of net formation, they were going to have about fourfold more so a score in, um, in disease activity over the next year. Suggesting again that we have this evidence of a subclinical disease activity and that this neutral activation may be a marker of patients that are very prone to flare and are more difficult to control on their current treatment methods. And the final uh, evidence or clinical data I would like to share with you is that levels of NETS in lupus patients, and these patients, please remember that they are very prone to develop cardiovascular disease. The levels of NETS in these patients were associated with development of arterial thrombosis, as well as myocardial infarction with an odds ratio of more than 9.5, even after adjusting for traditional cardiovascular risk factors. And we believe that this is due to the known role of NETS in activating endothelium, as well as activating platelets. But please bear in mind that this is a cross-sectional study, and we're currently trying to, aiming to investigate also the prognostic capacity of NETS in predicting 
who is going to develop a cardiovascular disease or not. So at this point, I've shown you quite a few clinical settings where neutral, neutrals are activated and they undergo this process of net formation. And this could have important clinical implications that you can use these markers to identify patients that have very severe disease. But now comes the question, of course, why do these patients have elevated levels of NET? And is there anything we can do to intervene and prevent these NETs or neutral activation to occur in these patients? And this question brought us back more than 70 years, back to the age of Dr. Hargraves back in 1948, I believe. And he was doing some, some bone marrow aspirates. And you can again see some and neutrophils here, but you also see some very different cells that I have highlighted here with arrows. I would assume some of you may recognize these cells, but for those of you who are unfamiliar with these cells, they're called LE cells, lupus erythematosus cells, and they were used diagnostically for many years uh, to identify patients with lupus. And what this is, is really a neutrophil that has eaten a large meal of nucleic acids that are opsonized with antibodies or complements. And we just learned that neutrophils, when they eat, they can either decide to nicely, nicely digest the meal and be happy, become apoptotic and be cleared. But another alternative though, as we learned, is that when a neutrophil eats something, it could also decide to blow up, to swell, to explode, to throw out all of these nets. What do we think happens now with this neutrophil that has eaten a huge meal? Will it be able to digest it or will it explode? We decided to look into that, asking the question, what happens with these neutrophils once they eat a lot of immune complexes? So we're going to do some live cell imaging here with the concept being that we're going to give to neutrophils. The neutrophils are all of those small black circles here. We're going to treat them with an immune complex from the lupus patient containing SMRNP antigen. We expect that to activate the neutrophil, and then hopefully these neutrophils will release some nets. If they do, we have added a dye called cytoxquine that will bind to all the exposed DNA. And that is why you already now see a lot of green color here. And those are unfortunately dead neutrophils. And that is the big caveat working with neutrophils that they are not easy to keep alive. But the majority of the cells here, as you can see, are alive. And now I will start an eight hour video and you'll see what happens when we add our new complex. As I hope you can appreciate the neutrophils just within five or 10 minutes, recognize those immune complexes and they become activated. They start stretching out, adhering more firmly to the cell culture plate. They start degranulating, they start undergoing ROS production. And now they look very differently, don't they? They look almost empty. Most of these cells now look like an empty shell. And one after another, they will start pop. And you'll see this beautiful green cloud surrounding the cells. And this is a neutrophil that has swollen and exploded, releasing this green and dusty web of DNA in the surrounding. This occurs here in, in our cell culture medium or our cell culture experiments, and we anticipate that the same immune complex will recognize the same neutrophil in the blood and explode, releasing all of these nucleic acids and harmful components into the circulation and causing inflammation and damage to the lupus. We then ask the question, what are the mechanisms driving this uh, process? And as we learned from, from our cocaine study, ROS is an important contributor to net formation. And here I would like you to focus on the red bar, which is our immune complex induced net formation. And we see when we add a ROS inhibitor, blocking both mitochondrial ROS and NADPH oxidase, we barely see any net formation anymore by the red immune complexes. So we next asked, could this be due to mitochondria component or could it be due to NADPH oxidase? So we blocked the mitochondria using a, a complex two inhibitor, TTFA. And although not as strong inhibition, 
we still see that blocking mitochondrial ROS reduces the capacity of immune complexes to activate the neutrophil. So mitochondria are, are now implicated, which was a novel finding at the time. And consistent with that interpretation, we found that immune complexes can activate neutrophils and their mitochondria to start generating reactive oxygen species. So what is really going on here with the mitochondria now? Why do they become activated by the immune complexes? We wanted to look further into this, so we did some fluorescence microscopy. And again, you can see the beautifully lobulated nuclei here in blue of the neutrophil. You can see the green uh, mitochondria, staying here for Tom 20. And then you barely, in this condition, see any DNA damage or DNA oxidation here in the red. But it will look very different now when we activate the neutrophils with immune complexes. Using the same immune complexes as in the video, you see this rapid decondensation of the nuclei and an early evidence or sign of net formation. You can also see that the green mitochondria, no longer are they present in the cytosol, but they seem to be just pushed towards the cell membrane. And of note, we also see this robust DNA oxidation, DNA damage. But strangely enough, it doesn't seem to be localized within the nuclei, but more so towards the end of the cell, co-localizing nicely with the mitochondria. Similarly, we found that also the released DNA contain oxidized DNA in the red, as well as mitochondrial components. And the oxidized DNA co-localized with mitochondria, but not with the nuclear blue DNA, again suggesting that maybe the oxidized DNA was of mitochondrial origin. So how could we confirm that? So we decided to develop this novel technology where we isolated the oxidized DNA using immunoprecipitation. And we then could uh, isolate the DNA and we could quantify the relative abundance of mitochondrial and genomic DNA using qPCR. And to find mitochondrial G uh, DNA, we use 16S. And to find genomic DNA, we use 18S. And using this approach, we found consistent with the microscopy pictures that oxidized DNA was highly enriched for 16S with enriched for mitochondria. So we propose that oxidized DNA is primarily of mitochondrial origin. So then why does this matter? Why does it matter if a DNA is genomic, mitochondrial, oxidized, or non-oxidized? It's still DNA. Well, maybe, just yes, maybe, it actually matters. Maybe one or the other is more inflammatory. We decided to ask that question whether oxidized DNA would be more inflammatory than the non-oxidized counterpart. So we incubated these DNAs isolated through immunoprecipitation with immune cells asking whether they could induce inflammation. And we found to our surprise that the oxidized DNA, which was much more inflammatory in than the non-oxidized DNA inducing interferon beta, TNF alpha, IL-6, and many other inflammatory cells. So what are then the pathways through which this DNA induces inflammation? Well, there are two main pathways that recognize this DNA. One being the TLR9, mid 88 dependent pathway, and one being the CGAS sting dependent pathway. One being in the cytosol, and the other one being the endosol. To investigate whether one of those pathways were involved in recognizing the oxidized DNA, we utilized mice that were either wild type lacking the mid 88 adapter protein or lacking the sting adapter protein. And we injected them with the oxidized DNA and then analyzed the development or the induction of interferon responses. And here as an outcome, we have MX1, which is an inflammatory marker of interferon induction. And we found that oxidized DNA induces inflammation in wild type mice as well as in the MIT-88 deficient mice lacking TOLAC receptors. However, if you lack the STING pathway or the CGA STING pathway, you no longer can recognize the oxidized DNA and they're protected from inflammation. So we could conclude that oxidized mitochondrial DNA signals through the CGA STING pathway inducing interference. So just to quickly 
summarize this part of the presentation, we again found that neutrophils can become activated and through a rust-dependent mechanism release NETs for highly inflammatory. But also the mitochondria may be released either by new complexes or by cocaine in the basal. And these mitochondria are highly inflammatory through their oxidized DNA, leading to induction of interference through the digesting pathway. The next question we then asked is, can we then block this process? Can we block mitochondrial damage? And will that then dampen the inflammatory outcome? And can we do so in vivo? And to do so, we utilized a mouse model of lupus called the MRL LPR mice. And at the time point of when they started to develop disease at 11 weeks, we gave them an osmotic pump containing mitochampo. And this is a mitochondrial rust scavenger. So it will still allow mitochondria to work, but it will scavenge the abundant mitochondrial rust to, to prevent damage from, from the rest of oxygen species. And then we sacrificed the mice after seven weeks and analyzed whether this, this treatment would have any benefit uh, in this, this mice model. And the first effect we saw was that Indeed, it seems as if when we block this process, when we block mitochondrial, or when we scavenge mitochondrial rust, the neutrophils are no longer able to produce as much external DNA. So we have a less of a DNA load in those mice. But more importantly, when treating these mice with mitotempo, the mitochondrial rust scavenger, they develop less autoantibodies. They develop markedly less kidney involvement and they, have, they develop less inflammation overall. So just by reducing the capacity of mitochondria to poison itself, we have ameliorated lupus-like disease in these animals. And we expect that similar mechanisms or similar approaches may also be applicable to humans where we can treat them or target this, this pathway of mitochondrial loss generation. And for the final part of the presentation, which is just another couple of slides, I also wanted to mention that mitochondria are thought to have a prokaryotic origin. And they're supposed to be within the cell, not being released. But we do know that upon this explosive net formation, mitochondria are also released. And now we are exposing to the immune system a very immunogenic organelle. We, we will develop antibodies to this. And this is frequently seen also in patients with myocardial infarction or any, any condition where you release a lot of mitochondria. We also see it in primary biliary cirrhosis, for instance. But it's also very common in lupus. Lupus patients, a high frequency of lupus patients, develop antibodies targeting the mitochondrial specific phospholipid cardiolipin. So they have anti cardiolipin antibodies. And this is, of course, associated with a very pro thrombotic. Uh, capacity and development of antiphospholipid syndrome. So it drives a lot of pathology and very severe comorbidities and mortalities in these patients. However, among the patients developing thrombosis, only about half of them or so have cardiolipin antibodies. But the other half don't have these cardiolipin antibodies, but they're still at high risk of developing cardiovascular disease. So we thought maybe there are other antibodies targeting mitochondria that are yet unidentified that could contribute and explain this increased risk of cardiovascular disease in these patients. So to investigate that, we developed a novel system in which we isolated ultra pure mitochondria. And we isolate or we incubate these mitochondria with sera from patients. And then we detect IgG binding using an anti human IgG antibody that is fluorescently labeled. And you can then detect these antibodies using flow cytometry. So using this technology, we found that indeed, lots and lots of lupus patients have antibodies targeting the mitochondrial membrane. And this is associated particularly with antiphospholipid syndrome and venous thrombosis. So it has an implication in, in cardiovascular disease. So since we saw this observation, we thought, well, maybe this is just due to the association with cardiolipin antibodies. 
maybe we're just measuring how resistant antibodies is with this assay. And we found that indeed, patients with cardiolipid antibodies, of course, have binding of IgG to the mitochondrial membrane, to the phospholipids of the mitochondria. But even patients without cardiolipid antibodies have a marked increased IgG binding to mitochondria as compared to healthy controls. So clearly, cardi clearly cardiolipid antibodies is not everything binding to mitochondria. Similarly, we found that blocking or absorbing cardiolipid antibodies from the serial lupus patients did not completely remove the binding of IgG to mitochondria. So there's something else to it. We asked whether this could be binding of antibodies to a mitochondrial protein, and we observed that using trypsin, removing the mitochondrial proteins from the cell surface, IgG was no longer able to bind. Similarly, using Western blot, using a mitochondrial extract, we found that IgG from lupus patients consistently recognized mitochondrial antigens of about 60 kD as well as of 35 kD. And we're currently investigating the exact identity of these proteins using mass spec. Also asking questions whether these novel anti-mitochondrial antibodies may be related to and maybe even be able to predict disease developments and in particular development of thrombosis. We have already identified some of these antimitochondrial antibodies also in rheumatoid arthritis, as well as in juvenile dermatomyositis, where the presence of these antibodies have a predictive capacity in identifying patients that are going to develop erosive disease in RA, as well as calcification or calcinosis in these young kids with juvenile dermatomyositis. So we think this is a very interesting and fascinating antibody and we are very eager to identify the exact identity of them. So to conclude, I hope I have shared with you some appreciation and enthusiasm for neutrophils today. And just to highlight again, we have discussed three key functions that I wanted to share with you in that neutrophils can be activated in these con many conditions, both by sterile inflammation as well as by infection, leading to the generation of reactive oxygen species and this allows for this explosive event where the neutrophil releases all of its nuclear content in this web-like structure. This is important for our uh, host defense, but it has also detrimental effects on our, uh, on, on our health, if not cleared properly. Also, I mentioned that mitochondria may be released and their oxidized DNA is highly inflammatory, signaling through the DNA sensing suggesting pathway. We also discussed that both nets and mitochondria contain epitopes that are being sensed in autoimmune conditions, and that we can use these antibodies as well as markers of neutral activation and neutral cell death in a clinical setting, identifying patients that have a very active disease, but more importantly, identifying patients that have a very severe disease progression, hopefully identifying the patients early enough to intervene. And finally, I briefly mentioned some of our mechanistic insights and the therapeutic target blocking the mitochondrial ROS or scavenging the mitochondrial ROS rather, and that that may be a potential target to reduce the release of these inflammatory nucleic acids and prevent autoimmunity in lupus and many neutrophil driven diseases. With that, I would like to acknowledge all of my collaborators, collaborators and colleagues, as well as funding agencies, as well as you for your attention, and I would be happy to take any questions if time allows. Uh, thank you so much. That was a really excellent uh, overview of so many different uh, emerging uh, areas of understanding in neutrophil biology. A few questions that came in from the chat. Early in, earlier in the talk, you were talking about uh, measuring net activity, and uh, a question came up from Dr. Young about whether um, the activity of nets is elevated in other disease states like sepsis and, and specifically IBD as well as obesity. I don't think we know too much about IBD to start there. We know that uh, IBD patients have nets in the, in the gut, so local, locally. But whether we also find evidence of circulating nets in IBD is, as far as I know, not evaluated yet. But we have evidence of neutral activation in those conditions, certainly. Similarly, with many infectious diseases, we also see neutral activation and net formation. So it's not specific for, for autoimmune conditions, but more a general phenomenon for both infectious and inflammatory diseases. But in, in many of those conditions, we still have to figure out whether it could help 
identify patients that are more prone to develop severe disease. One of my colleagues over at Michigan, um, Ann Arbor, Michigan, recently published on COVID-19, for an instance, where they found that levels of NETS could identify those patients that are more so prone to develop a very severe um, disease uh, requiring ventilation. And I, we published a, collab a joint paper on that as well using calprotectin, also identifying those patients that were, had a very severe disease progression. So I think it's relevant in both inflammatory and infectious diseases. Another question that came in uh, was that neutrophils are clearly pro-inflammatory in many settings, but uh, more question why they are not helpful in fighting cancer since the presence of neutrophils are associated with less effective anti-tumor immunity across a number of malignancies. That's a very interesting question, and we have been thinking somewhat on that, even though I'm mainly focusing on autoimmunity. Uh, neutrophils could also take this phenotype of uh, myeloid suppressor of our cells. So they could infiltrate tissue and again suppress, uh, suppress the immune system and, and thus protect the, uh, the tumor. But they also release all of these different molecules um, that, that do seem to support tumor growth. And I don't think that we fully understand why that is currently, but we certainly need to consider targeting neutrophils uh, also in malignancy. Yeah. Um, another question that came up was whether monoclonal antibodies uh, could be produced to net specific antigens and use that to sort of modify inflammation without triggering autoimmunity. It's an interesting concept. I would be cautious about this though for a couple of reasons. One being that nets are not always formed the same way. Their, their core, I suppose, would be similar, but they could, could contain different molecules depending on how they're induced such as with cocaine, for an instance, we seem to amplify or, or get more neutral elastics, whereas with other stimuli, we get more of other molecules. Uh, so that would be, would be one comment to make on that. The other concept is that as soon as you oxygenize them with antibodies, at least in lupus, maybe we could modify or engineer the antibody, then you will prevent the natural degradation by DNA, and which is kind of the main way we currently clear, clear net. So I would rather favor either blocking the NAT process at all or clearing NATs by adding more DNA to these patients. Sort of piggybacking on that question, do you find that in folks uh, compared to healthy controls, they have a, they have a, a decreased amount of those sorts of scavenger molecules like DNA and those kinds of things? Correct. In many of the conditions we have analyzed, at least in RA and in lupus, we see this impaired clearance of net. And it could be due to low, low uh, levels of DNases, but also again, this protective role of antibodies targeting the net. As soon as the antibodies bind, DNases will no longer be able to reach the DNA, and instead you have an immune complex that will activate your immune system. So there are different mechanisms that, that could happen too, but yes, they are unable to clear their, their net. And it could also be on the macrophage side, that the macrophage doesn't really recognize the net. Well, thank you again for that excellent talk. Um, I don't see any other questions so far in the chat or uh, in the Q&A section. If anyone else has questions, feel free to type them in. Uh, but uh, I'm seeing wonderful talk come through, as I'm sure you are too, and uh, truly just a really awesome overview. I learned a lot, and I know everyone else did as well. So thank you, Dr. Liu. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in.